Noon, everybody. My name is Jeannie Borum. I'm part of the Sign World team here and will be the moderator for our session today. I'm pleased to have those of you attending join us. Um, for those who have not attended one of these in the past or watched one of our recorded sessions, I'll just give you a brief overview of our format so you know what to expect for today. Um, first, we're going to have each of our owners that are on our panel um, introduce themselves, give a little bit about their background and a little overview about their business. And then we're going to turn the floor over to our participants for each of you to go ahead and be able to ask a question that will be individually answered by each of the panelists. Um, so you get multiple perspectives um, in response to your question. Uh, we do ask you to keep it to a single question at a time, um, depending on number of attendees. If we're allowed to uh, have time for second questions, we will. Um, but I'm sure other attendees might be asking similar questions that you might be thinking too. So just start thinking about what those questions are that you want to ask our panelists when you have that opportunity. Um, so with that said, I'm going to turn it over to our owners to introduce themselves and give an overview of their background. Um, let's start with you, Mr. Conklin. Uh, yeah, Don Conklin, my wife Teresa and I opened up Pinnacle Custom Signs in Buford, Georgia, which is outside of Atlanta, 11 years ago, hard to believe. Started in 2,000 square feet with two employees. We are now in 12,500 square feet with 20 employees, probably need three more. Uh, this year looks like we're about to, we're closing in on four and a half million dollars this year. Uh, biggest project today, we were doing all the vehicles, wrapping all the vehicles for Vroom, which is uh, the um, online car shopping business, sort of like Carvana. Um, and did I miss a question? Background? How big is that, How big oh, is that project? Background. Yeah, but the Vroom is the biggest project right now. And then background, I was not. How big is that project? How many dollars? Uh, it's about, how many cars? It, it's going to wind up being close to 350 vehicles. So it's going to wind up being close to $600,000 over two years. So, okay. um, and my background is I was in operations. I was in uh, um, customer operations in AT&T slash Bell South for 25 years before I joined Sign World. Very good. Thank you, Don. How about you, Ben? Uh, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Ben King. I run King Signs Graphics and Imaging in Minneapolis. I've been at it about five and a half years. I am still in my uh, first lease at 2,000, uh, a little over 2,000 square feet, but looking to take on the, the I'm in negotiations to, to expand into the location next to us. It just, we're working on timing on that. I have uh, four employees right now. I need probably two to three more. Um, and we'll do about one point. 3 million, I think, projected this year. Um, my largest project, I'm going to actually give you two. So we're doing all the rebranding for a furniture company up here called Becker Furniture at seven locations. When it's all said and done, it'll be about 350 grand. Um, but the, and the, most of that being outsourced kind of large channel, ledger, large channel letter projects. But one of the cooler um, things is I've gotten in with a, a group called Varsity Group and I've done graphics at 44 different schools. Um, and so they actually go out and sell and then we design, produce and install. And that's been about 160 grand um, and just continues, you know, they're, they're always building a new school or getting, getting new funding. So that one's been kind of cool. And then before this, um, I was in retail management at Target for about 15 years. Very good. Thank you, Ben. Yep. I see we have Tony joining us. Thanks for joining us today, Tony. If you can go ahead and give an overview of your background and your business, that'd be great. All right. Thanks very much. So uh, we are Baltimore Signs and Graphics. Uh, we're located in Rosedale, uh, Maryland, which is just north of Baltimore. We're at an intersection of the, the I-95 corridor and the Baltimore Beltway, so the location is uh, optimal for customer access. Um, we service pretty much the whole Baltimore metro area, Baltimore County, Hartford County, you know, we'll go farther too. It just depends who's calling us and what the deal is. Um, we opened our doors January of 2020, which was three months before COVID kicked in. So it was a fun time. Um, so we're, I guess we're, uh, we're at the two and a half year mark right now. Um, I've got a, a very uh, abnormal, large facility. I've got 5,200 square feet and that's because uh, the price was right at the time, 
and it was the same price as what would have been a little bit north and which would have been 2,500 square feet, which is, you know, I don't know, between 2,000 and 2,500 is what you're targeting when you initially open. But uh, we went for the larger location because of the dock. It had the access to drive large vehicles into it to do wraps. And we do, we do full size tractor trailers in there and everything. So it just made sense at the time and uh, it's working out so far. Um, we have three employees, including myself. We've had as many as four. We bring in, uh, you know, people to help us whenever we need to, but I have a very solid network of subcontractors that we use that um, enables me to not have to hire more employees, although I do need a project manager. I can tell you that straight up right now. Um, 2022 sales projections were probably going to hit 750,000 this year. Um, my biggest customer is Johns Hopkins University. Um, they continue to provide us more, more and more uh, business. Uh, their fiscal year just ended, so we've got um, probably $60,000 in fleet branding that's already been paid for because they had to pay before the the fiscal year ended and they've got another hundred thousand dollar on campus project coming our way I, I hope it's coming our way we'll see but um they are my biggest customer and uh, i came from pepsico i was 32 years at pepsico uh, mostly in sales and uh in national account management very good thank you for that overview tony uh jack i am jack werner i joined sunroll back in 1995 as a sunroll operation Back in the days when it was more of a retail location, doing more vinyl graphics, more of a banner shop, and the yellow pages. Um, started in 1,100 square feet with one employee, grew to uh, 5,000 square feet, staff 11, doing 1.3 million in sales. Then joining Ken at the corporate office, uh, learning his end of the business, and kind of a partnership arrangement, finished buying him out eight years ago uh, next month. Uh, and so, uh, when it comes to answering questions today, it goes more to my experience running an operation. I'll speak from their perspective. It goes more to training and policy and that I'll speak from the corporate side. Very good. Thank you, Jack. None of us would be here today without our founder, Ken, if you can go ahead and give an introduction. Hi, everybody. Thank you for joining us. My name is Ken Kent. I'm the founder of Sign World 34 years ago. I started with my own sign company in Honolulu, Hawaii. And uh, I'm still here in Hawaii, and um, I can see my uh, former business uh, out my window two blocks away. Um, a lot of people ask me, why did I choose the sign business? And uh, my answer is, number one, is the ability to make good money in the least amount of time with the fewest number of people, meaning not a lot of employees and not a lot of customers. And today, the, the chokehold, the bottleneck is employees. Well, if you have a business that only needs a few employees to make a very good living, I think you're far, far better off than a business, uh, a, a franchise or a service franchise where you have to have a lot of employees. So uh, let me uh, just give you a 30 second example here. Let's fast forward to the day and, and Don, Don Conklin, quick question. How much could you sell your business for today? Um, probably close to $5 million. Close to $5 million. All right. So let's just shave that a little bit. Let's say, you want to sell your business for $2 million when you're ready to retire. Well, here's what a $2 million sign world looks like. These are the benchmarks. It's one building, same zip code you live in or pretty close. It's 14 employees, 14 employees. It's pretty much nine to five, Monday through Friday. And you're home for dinner every night. But if you look at some of those other opportunities that you're looking at, service businesses and so on, more than likely you're looking at not one building, but three or four buildings to have a $2 million business. You're not looking at 14 employees, you're looking at over a hundred employees, over a hundred. You're looking at thousands of customers. And more than likely, it's not nine to five Monday through Friday. It's six days a week, 10 hours a day with a lot of your money being made on Saturday. 
So the question you want to ask yourself at your stage in life, midlife, do you want for the next 10 or 15 years to have a business where you're going to have to hire 400 people in order to end up with 100 at the time you want to retire? Do you want to go through all that recruiting and training effort? So the beauty of a sign business, a small manufacturing business is very few employees, very few customers. Okay. Thank you, Ken. All right, now it's time for our participants to ask their questions. Again, we request you to keep it to a single question each time, um, and then we'll give each of our owners a chance to answer it. I'll go in order of how I saw you join our session today. So I believe, Mark, you were the first to join us. If you can take yourself off of mute, share where you're from, and give us your first question for today. All right, good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Mark, and I'm... Uh, out of Beaumont, Alberta in Canada. And uh, the question I have, and this is typically the first question I ask uh, any of the validation uh, calls I'm on. Um, there are many ways to generate leads through uh, marketing and networking. What is the most effective lead generation in the first year? And as the business changes and develops and grows, uh, does that uh, method change over time? I'll let everyone answer that. Thank you. Great, great question, Mark. And uh, when you started your business, depending on when you started your business, how you marketed it was probably different. So let's go ahead and start with Tony, who is our newest owner, to share about the marketing of his business in the first year. So when I opened, I had, um, I'm, I'm born and raised in this area. So I had a network of people that were waiting for me to open. I kind of built it up ahead of time. So initially it was people I knew because um, it takes a while to get your website ramped up. Six months after we opened, you know, after the COVID restart, um, the website started kicking in. So most of my leads and business came from the website. Um, so we, you know, Dan recommends, you know, several of the uh, um, web designers uh, that we talked to. And, you know, I picked one of them and they did a fantastic job and helped me develop the website and uh, getting the pay-per-clicks going and uh, with Google and things like that. So, you know, after six months, most of the business came from those uh, pay-per-click activities and, and the website. And nothing's changed. I still have the same budget. I still have the same pay-per-click budget. So I'm, I haven't changed any of that. But I can tell you that um, two year, two and a half years in, um, uh, your, your existing customer base are coming back for more business and they're referring more business. So uh, the business transitions from you know, mostly pay-per-click to people that are redoing more business and, but, but I haven't changed anything. So it's just, it's just the business is shifting, but everything's still the same as far as how we, um, how we go about it. So two quick questions for you, Tony, you talked about budget for marketing. How much do you spend monthly for your marketing? Um, probably $1,800. I think it is 1800 to 2000 at the most. Okay. And what percent of your new business uh, comes from your internet? Uh, it was probably 85 and now it's probably i'm gonna say 70 but that's because i i I'm, I'm turning down some of the leads because i'm taking care of existing customers yep absolutely and, and that good. marketing budget by the way that is strictly the you know the the website and the paper clicks etc i mean i do some other networking things that uh, also go into marketing absolutely very good thank you tony ben uh some words uh, experience with Tony. So, I, you know, I knew when I started that I wanted to leverage the internet um, and get weeds that way. Um, I felt like if I found customers that I that needed a sign or, or, or were curious about learning more about signs that I would be able to sell them. And so I, I prioritized putting resources and energy into my web and following up on those leads and probably didn't do as much as maybe some of the other owners that you may have talked to around Chamber of Commerce or Rotary or BNI or things of that nature. Um, so from the start, I've spent $2,500 a month, every month on, on web marketing and similar to Tony, when I first, you know, I, I can trace back to a, a lot of my, um, customers, a lot of my, you know, people that, are, that I work with to that, those internet, those internet leads in those, in those days, even though I've spent the same amount today, I've try to shift my internet focus or my what my web company is doing to be a little bit more surgical and so it's not as broad of a bucket of weeds that I'm getting so now we're 
we really chase kind of things in six different buckets. And, and if it's not one of those six, six different buckets, then I, you know, I might do them if, if everything lines up, but like Tony, I'm turning it down. I'd say initially 75% of my business, 80% of my business came from the internet. And now while those clients came to me from the internet, each month, only about 20, 15 to 20% of my business are new clients. And the other 80 to 85% are existing clients coming back for maybe some, sometimes more of the exact same sign. But a lot of times it's like, hey, you did this car wrap for us. Now we're moving into a, a retail space. Can you do the lobby <clears throat> sign, do the window graphics or whatever? So um, yeah, I don't know. But I think I answered all the yep. Very good. Thank you, Ben. Don, you started in the day when the internet wasn't such a key focus. Tell us your story. That's not true. I'm not that old. I'm not Jack. Come on. No, we started. Uh, okay. So as Tony says, transition, you start with, um, you know, chambers of commerce and other business networking groups, get your website up, generate a lot of activity on the website. And then as you get customers, it's referrals. So today, 11 years in, 70% of my business is repeat customers of the other 30%. Half of that's the internet, half of that's referrals from other, other customers, um, which doesn't sound like a lot, but 15% of four and a half million dollars is roughly about three quarters of a million dollars when we get off the web new this year. So that's how Vroom found me, by the way. So very good. Thank you, Don. Jack, was there was the internet even in business back then? Uh, we barely had telephones. <laughs> <laughs> tin cans and a string. Uh, there's no doubt that the internet does take a few months to get the business going. So it's not just open up the doors, have the internet kick in and, and it comes, unless you throw extra money into pay-per-click ads. And some owners have done that more to generate it sooner. So it does take some networking, chamber of commerce, networking, rotary club, things you may not be anxious to do. But if I can temporarily do it while the internet kicks in and I don't have to do it long-term by the end of the first year, I can Eliminate a lot of that. Uh, it's doable. Know that 90% of our owners have never done sales before. It's not a sales pitch. It's a consultative role. We're looking for customers who already have a need. We're saying I've managed projects previously. I can manage yours. So it's your operational skill set that's really going to drive the business, which is different from the competition. Very good. Thank you, Jack. Ken, any thoughts? Um, nothing to add, but a quick recap. Uh, Tony is spending about 1800 to 2000 a month. Ben, what did you say you're spending? Uh, 2500 And Don, what do you spend currently? To get that three quarters yeah, of a million. Yeah, about 3500 in total. So, you know, less than 1% of my, my revenue. Right. But still bringing in three quarters of a million dollars worth of revenue. Okay. Go ahead. Very good, thank you. All right, let's go to our next participant. Uh, Chris, if you can take yourself off mute, share where you're from and go ahead with your first question for the group today. Hi everyone, uh, Chris Meadows. I'm from um, Manhattan, Illinois, which is a uh, small town on the southwestern outskirts of uh, suburban Chicagoland. Um, my question, and, and I've listened to several of the pre-recorded webinars. And, and so I'll, I'm, I'm going to ask a similar question that I've heard before, but try to put a different spin on it. I, I, I look around my local area and I see a lot of sign manufacturers and, and a lot of them with, with four and five star ratings. And I guess my question is, what, what do your customers tell you is the reason they chose you versus your competition? And has that reason or has that competitive advantage changed over time? Great question. Ben, let's start with you this time. Um, you know, I, I think it's your response time when it's initially, right? And then are you gonna deliver on what you say you're gonna deliver? And that, that doesn't mean there's not gonna be delays. We've, we, trust me, we've experienced material delays and stuff like that. So, you know, I think you just have to keep, it, it's good customer service. At the end of the day, we all make signs that other sign shops make that not anything, I don't have a copyright or a patent on anything that, that I do. Um, so my team is what's gonna differentiate us. And I tell my team that all the time, right? We are what makes our sign shop different than the next one. And so we have to deliver on what we say, we gotta deliver a good product on time and then keep those lines of communication open when, 
when we're going to fall short of that. And if you do that, you, you know, people aren't looking to, to refine a new sign company every time they need a sign. Um, if you did what you say and, and deliver on that, they're going to call you back and be like, hey, let's do it again. So, um, and even if other sign shops have four and five star ratings, that probably does, you know, that's not a guarantee that they're, they deliver the best service. Or they deliver, let me rephrase that. That doesn't mean they deliver service that you can't. Very good. Thank you, Ben. Don, how about you? Why do customers buy from you? What do they tell you? Because Teresa's in the business. No, actually, uh, we tell people all the time, it's three things, speed of service, quality of service, and the team providing the service. Um, a lot of our competitors can do one or two of those. They can't do all three of those. So, uh, and speed is key. Uh, ben said it as well. You know, sometimes we, we can uh, respond to customers and get deposits from customers before any of the, our competitors actually bother to return the phone call to the customer. So uh, it's uh, velocity is the key for us. Velocity, there's that word. All right, very good. Thank you, Don. Tony? Uh, I, it's pretty much the same as what, what, uh, what you guys just said um, with, with Ben and Don. I can tell you that um, on, on, on Google, we have 57 five-star reviews. And I would say a third of my customers that came from the internet will say, well, you know, I, I read your reviews and I invest, I, you know, I researched you guys and you guys seem to be the best. So that is a big factor. Um, and then a lot of times when you go out and see a customer face-to-face -face interaction is key. But when you get there, they say, well, I can't believe, you know, the reason you're here is you, you return my phone call. So, and Jack and, and Dan and Ken will tell you that. And, and Gene will tell you that, that, if you answer the phone and return the phone calls, you're, you're, you got a better shot at getting the business because, and, and that's reiterating what Don just said. So that, that happens with me as well. So question before we go to Jack, um, for you current owners, what percent of the business that you provide a quote on, do you convert into an estimate and actually win? Do you guys know your conversion rates? Um, 80, 80, 85%. 85 for you, Don? Tony? I'm probably fluctuating between 55 and, and 70, somewhere in that range. Um, it, it, you know, it, if I, if I meet the customer face to face, it, it jumps way up. So it, it depends how much time I have to get in front of the customer, but I like getting in front of them because that's, that's what I, it's almost a guarantee. And how about you, Ben? Similar to Tony, uh, we are probably a little lower this year than we were last year only because I really pushed my team about doing more formal estimating. So if I look at when I track and I track my estimate dollars month over month and they've really shot up. So our conversion is, you know, kind of gone down a little bit, but our sales in turn have gone up. So I'm fine with that conversion going down a little. Very good. Thank you. Jack, your thoughts? You know, first off, it's a crowded market. There's lots of sign companies out there. We believe there's 22,000 in the States, uh, but it's a $50 billion industry and each one can only handle so much it's bandwidth to get to others. Knowing that most sign companies are not owned by business people, but owned by former sign makers, they're used to single task at a time and not worried about the next one. And so their response time is much slower than ours. Well, some might get some good reviews. I think ours would actually, our reviews would actually exceed those. Um, first month, you're only looking for 10 customers and second month, 15 and third month, 20. You've got to build process and procedures to go bigger. So it's a way to do it. I had 10 competitors within a mile of my operation when I started. I, I looked at it as an opportunity. If there's that many there, there's a lot of business. So while there's some that have good ratings, they can't get to everybody. Very good. Ken, any thoughts to share? Show up on time for the first appointment, deliver the sign on time, on spec, and you'll always be busy. Absolutely. Thank you, Ken. Okay, let's go to our next participant, uh, Logan. If you can take yourself off a of mute, share where you're from, and go ahead with your first question for the group today. Hey, good morning. My question is about growth. Uh, so in the first five years, what were y'all seeing for your compounded annual growth rate? And then as a part of that, what type of CapEx reinvestment rate was required and network cap networking capital reinvestment rate? Thank you. Very good. So year over year growth and capital expenditures as you were growing. Uh, Don, I see you looking up to the ceiling. Not sure if you can remember back to the early days, but uh, what's your thoughts about that? 
I'm like an elephant. I never forget. Mm -hmm. um, 300, 500, a million, a million and a half, 2 million in our first five years. So you can do the math on that. Probably about a 75 to 80% um, Kager on that one. At CapEx, it really just depends. You can continue to grow without spending any more capital if you don't want to do it yourself. You can always outsource it or you can bring everything else in house and buy vehicles and buy machinery and stuff like that. We were probably uh, middle of the ground on that one. And you know, the, all of our CapEx was out of oper operating funds. We were doing 22 to 25% um, uh, net margin. So we had plenty of operating capital to fund small routers, vehicles, and things like that, so. Very good, thank you, Don. Tony? Uh, we're 60% year one and looking the same, um, you know, continued on. So we're, we're just hanging around that 60% growth mark. And I have gone with the model of no CapEx. Uh, I, I, out, I, I have terrific, you know, um, partners and in, in installers and fabricators and things like that. So I'm, I'm the no CapEx guy. I'll have to remember that one. Like it. All right, very good, Ben. Um, so initially, you know, 50 to 60% year over year, the first couple of years, and then COVID, we, we probably saw uh, 20 to 30% uh, year over year growth. But this year, I think, well, that number will jump back up probably even 40, we could even hit 50% if a couple of the orders come through. Similar to what Tony and Don said, I, I haven't had to do any additional capital expend, uh, expenditure, you know, flood the, the business with any additional money. I too, like Tony said, have a couple of vendors that I've just leaned on harder. Um, as I've seen that um, growth now, when I get that, you know, if I get into additional square footage, that that may change where I then look to bring on more of that um, production capability in house. But as of right now, it's been very, very, very little additional capital expense. Thank you, Ben. Jack? I did 430, 580, 780, and just over a million four years. Um, nobody brings in more equipment until second, third, fourth year. Some never do. And others do as they want to control the processes in the back room. That's a choice to be made later. Ken, any thoughts? I'm not. Okay, very good. All right, let's go to our next uh, participant. Uh, we have someone logged in as AG. I'm not quite sure um, if you can share your name and where you're from and go ahead with your first question. That'd be great. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Anthony. I'm from Maryland. And I'm wondering if you all could share the story of your most instrumental employee other than yourselves within your first two years and the story of how you hired and developed that employee and where'd you find them? All right, first employee, how'd you find them? How'd you hire them? Most, most them? instrumental. Most instrumental, that's right. Not the first, most important one. Don, you've had lots of employees. Let's start with you. You can't say Teresa. That's right. I'm not going to say or Teresa. Either of your sons. They're excluded oh, wait too. Wait a minute. That's that's who my first employee was. Was my son. I had a 21 year old. Son. Talking about you, Matthew. I have a 20 21 year old son. Graduated college. Came. He, uh, he started the business with us. He went to all the training. We hired another sign maker from another company um, to train Matt. Matt learned everything. Matt can do everything in the business today. Um, so I guess it was a captive audience because he was living at my house. So I had that going for me. Um, so from that standpoint, and there are the other key employees we got, they came from other sign companies. We are a better sign company to work for. We treat people well. We're not a, a sweatshop. We give them benefits. We treat them like they want to be treated. So it's the environment and the culture that you create that will bring you people who want to come. And then I have my, uh, my manager of fabrication came on and he brought two people that used to work with him because they were working in a sweatshop. So that's kind of how it works. You know, if you create the environment, the employees will come. Thank you, Don. We'll go to Tony next. He's probably going to mention Lydia's, but uh, we're, we got a trend going here today. Tony? Yep. So uh, my first employee was my production manager, as everybody's supposed to hire when you start up. And um, he's still with me, uh, but uh, certainly not my most instrumental employee because he's, uh, well, let's not get into that. But my second hire was my daughter. She was a graphic designer out of college and she was the second hire. And um, she keeps an eye on everything that's uh, going out the door and catches all the 
all the potential mistakes and make sure we're on the right track. So I'm going to say that she is my most instrumental employee. And they both there. So the three of us have been here together the whole time with a couple of the other folks in and out, but she's been in the business now two years. Very good. All right, Ben, someone who didn't hire with the family. I didn't know my, my kids are 12 and 10 and uh, they, they still want to be a professional hockey player and an astronaut. So I'm working on sign owner, but we'll get there eventually. Um, Cause neither one of them is going to space or playing in the NHL. Um, my, I'm going to go with my second hire um, who's still with me today. Um, he actually celebrated his five year anniversary yesterday. Um, and why I answer him, I got him through Indeed or ZipRecruiter, one of those. I mean, that, that back then, that's even that's even evolved over the last probably six months of how fruitful those two websites are. But back then, he he applied. He was a graphic designer out of school. Um, he came with no sign experience, um, so he but he can now do a lion's share of almost everything. And why I'd say he's the most helpful in, in the inspirational is that because he's seen the business grow. He can kind of fill in in every every spot, whether it's quoting, customer service, installation, production, and and then he now kind of leads my new hire training. So when a new hire comes on board, we go through the packet, create the checklist, I give it to Tyler, and then I just do occasional, probably every thirty day check ins with the employee, where we then talk about you know what what have you not learned, what is Tyler not showing you. So he's he's been my right hand since you know probably I'd say a year and a half into his employment. Very good. Thank you, Ben. Jack? Yeah. Uh, my third hire, who I think I hired in month five, uh, was still with me nine and a half years later when I sold the business. Had no graphic skills, had no computer skills, was a master sign maker. I could give him any project and he could figure out how to do it. And uh, he was in charge of quality control of all the other staff. Uh, uh, just made sure we put out top-notch stuff every time. How'd you find him? Uh, he came from another sign company, looking for a job. Okay, very good. Thank I you, Jack. To have your home. Mm -hmm. Ken, any thoughts? Nothing bad. All right, very good. Let's go to our next participant, uh, Soji. If you can take yourself off mute, share where you're from, and give us your question for the group today. Yes, hi there. Can you guys hear me? We can. Perfect. Thanks. Thanks for taking my call. I appreciate it. Um, so uh, my name is Soji. I'm calling in from uh, Mississauga, which is just outside Toron Toronto in Canada. Um, uh, first of all, thanks for all the information. I have just been religiously going through all the web, the, the webinars you guys have put up. I think I'm towards the, I'm towards finishing 2020. 2021 right now <laughs> so i'm just lapping it in tons there's a ton of information there I, I i really appreciate that so the question i have is um if you as uh seasoned uh sort of owners of sign world business if you had to give say your top three advice to a newcomer into the business what would those be um sort of leveraging off your your, your 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 strengths and and weaknesses your 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 losses and success uh, what would be those top three things that you would say guys keep an eye on these three things and you'll be uh you'll be sailing all right advice to new owners three key points ben what would you say um the, the speed john talked about it before but the speed of which you re respond to, to clients particularly initially, but kind of always. Um, and then my, my thing that I think really allowed us to kind of go fast is I didn't get too caught up in like the, I have to hit this profit margin on this project. Because even if I, I felt like, man, I thought I'd make 33%, I only made 28%. Yes, that's 5% less, but I learned something from it. And every, well, you have to look at every client interaction, every sign project as a chance for you or your team to learn. Um, and, and yes, you need to make money, but if you only worry about that, if that's the, if that's the, I've got to hit these numbers, or I don't want to do the project. You're going to go so slow in trying to get those numbers exactly right. That that client's going to have already talked to Don and already have a signed contract in hand. Right. And so that those two things, I, I guess to me, I'm going to limit it to just those two. Like if you, if you do those two things, I think you're going to be far more successful early, um, and learn and learn while you go. 
So quick to respond to meet with them and then quick to provide a quote. Yeah. And, you know, and then again, like I always said, if man, if I don't make as much money, but I got a five star review and a picture for my website, that's worth a couple of profit points there as well. Right. Mm -hmm. And so I didn't focus on like, no, no, this is an in-house project. I need to make 78 points on it or 75 points on it. I'd try that, you know, sometimes I bid that. And then when I'd get all the way done, I'd be like, ooh, I didn't quite hit those numbers. But I got a five-star review, a picture of it, and I learned. And that, that to me was worth almost another thousand dollars, right? And so um, that's how I looked at it. Very good. Tony is our newest owner. What would you say would be your advice to other new owners? So uh, first thing would be, you know, Sign World is going to give you a process to follow. And, you know, you got to follow the process, you, it, it, at least 90% of it. I mean, you may not hit every button, but you got to follow the process, in my opinion. So first thing is follow the process. Second thing is, I'm going to reiterate what Ben said, don't get caught up in every single dollar and every single report and every your first year, you got to learn the sign business. So you know, some guys come in as finance, financial people, some guys come in as salespeople, some guys come in as something else. You, you gotta, you gotta learn the business and your first year, you just have to, you know, chalk up your first year as, as devoting it to the business and learning the business. And, um, and, and don't, you know, if you're a financial guy, you can't dig into every single number that's out there. You're, you're going to drive yourself crazy and not learn the business. And the third thing, um, I know the sign world will tell you don't work in the business, work on the business. But in my opinion, year one, you've got to get out and do some installs and you have to learn, you have to understand the business to learn how to keep growing it and to avoid mistakes. So uh, maybe the first year, you know, get in the business a little bit, um, just make sure you have a, a way to get back out of it too. Very good. Thank you, Tony. Don is our veteran uh, owner. You've given lots of advice over the years. What's your top three? Uh, um, a wise man once told me 11 years ago, a um, guy named Tom Humphreys, who you guys all know, he said, there's three keys to success. He said, answer the phone, answer the phone, and answer the phone, right? And I find that to be probably some of the best advice I have, but I will tell you this. One is answer the phone and respond to the customer. Two is provide the customer what the customers ask for in a timely basis. And number three is know where you're going, know your numbers, know what your targets are, know what your budgets are and things like that. Because if just like, um, you know, if you don't know your target, as, um, as the Cheshire Cat said, if you don't know where you're going, any road will take you there. You gotta have a target, you gotta be shooting for something. Thank you, Don. Jack? You know, the first one goes to responding to the customer, getting the quote and delivering the product on schedule. Second one is building the culture of the team you're going to work with. I didn't have any employees. Nobody worked for me. They all worked with me. We were staff. We were a team. I couldn't get to make a number, number without their help. I knew it. And they knew it. So working together rather than working for it. Third is, while the internet drives so much business, in some ways it's our worst enemy. Sometimes we're so busy chasing a stranger that we're not really leveraging the customer that already believes in us and already placed an order and finding out who else they know. No, no customer should be at that end. Uh, if we want this business to be more and more repeat business instead of being transactional, chasing others, we got to leverage the existing customers into more and more repeat business. Thank you, Jack. Ken? You know what everybody said. Number one, be an on-time person in everything you do. Number two, nurture your employees. Nurture them. And number three, manage by your numbers. Analyze your numbers, manage your numbers. Very good. Jack, you want to share your slideshow quick? I will. <laughs> so there's three slides that I'm going to show. There's no audio to them, so we'll go on with questions while they go on. The first one shows some of the operations inside and out, so you can see, unlike a franchise, we're helping to build your world. No two sign will look or operate the same. Second one goes to what is a sign? Not only what can we make in-house with our own original equipment, along with what we'll outsource to others or perhaps bring in-house later on, and last part of that slideshow goes to some unusual things that you might not even think of as a sign, shows that our product base is even bigger. The third slideshow goes to some of our wall of fame, showing you some of the bigger projects that we do. We're not just making, not necessarily little things, but lots of things and bigger, bigger, more complicated projects. Thank you, Jack. 
Okay, well, that's uh, we've got the group answer their first round of questions. Uh, we have time for more. So for our participants, um, if you want to go ahead at the very bottom of the Zoom window, you can hit raise hand and I can see who might have a second question they'd like to ask. And we'll just go through a second round um, for those who have additional questions. Give you a Jeannie, moment. Uh, Logan Ridley is on the phone only. I don't think he has the ability to raise his hand. So very, please don't very, miss him. Thank you, Ken. Thank you. Logan, do you have a question? I see you're off mute. Actually, I'm getting dialed in. I'm getting dialed in from the car right now. I was able to get to a stopping point. So I'll, I'll, I'll pay attention right now. I think I should be able to raise my hand. So Chris, I see your hand is raised. Go ahead with your second question, please. Thanks. Um, I'm just curious for the, for the group, how much selling and sales experience each owner had coming into the uh, sign world business and, and what they find has been the key for them in B2B selling uh, in, in signage. Absolutely. So Tony, how much sales experience did you have? And let's just add a little extra twist to it. Cause I think the three of you have a little bit more sales background than, than most of our owners do. When you think of other owners in the network, um, you know, what do you think are their keys to success having not had sales experience in their background? So kind of answer it for yourself and then just broadly, Tony, let's start with you. So I, I had extensive sales experience, um, you know, most of my career at Pepsi. So let's just call it 20 years of sales experience. Um, and, you know, everybody that comes into this with a different background and, and you, you know, you figure out how to use your, your strengths and leverage those strengths. And if, if selling is not your strength, then you, you know, you have another facet of the business that is, and, you know, you, you, you kind of just figure it out as time goes on. So I, I don't, I don't really have the answer. I mean, yeah, it was easier for me to sell because that's where I came from. But, you know, I didn't, I don't have the financial or the marketing or whatever else that goes along with the other facets of the business. And you just kind of pick those up. And I'll tell you, the mastermind groups, I don't know if, if they, if the panel or if the um, attendees have understand what a mastermind group is, but that's how we communicate with uh, the people that started with us. Um, and, and whatever you lack in your experience, you pick up through mastermind groups and conversations and the support network through SignWorld. Um, maybe you could just expand a little bit what you view the sales process is like as an owner. Well, for me, uh, you know, it's, it's all about listening to the customer. And like I said, being face-to-face, -face. you got, you got to get face-to-face -face with the customer. You got to get off your, get all out of your seat and out to see them in person, um, find out what they want. And it goes back to the timing that we've already mentioned multiple times. You know, if you're, if you say you're going to have the quote back to them tomorrow, uh, make sure it's back in a professional format either through, uh, through the software that we have or in a, you know, I do mine in PowerPoint presentations and you know, we list the features and the benefits and, you know, uh, I don't, I don't, I'm not bashful about showing our reviews and things like that. And some of the examples that we've done. So you don't have examples as a new owner, but uh, you can still put a professional presentation together. And again, that goes back to leveraging your network and um, you know, hopefully you know how to put a presentation together or, or using the software, but either way, uh, it goes back to the timing it back to the customer and being professional. Very good. Thank you, Ben, your background and how it's worked for you in the sign world industry or sign business. Um, yeah. So I, I didn't have any direct sales experience. Um, what I did have was, uh, but what I, what I liked about the sign industry was I think there's a part component of its sales, a component of its customer service, a component of its project management. Um, and that customer service and project management, I did have kind of extensive experience in. And so that's what I kind of lean on as I became a better and better sign salesman. Um, similar to, you know, you're going to you're going to have a lot of owners that are in your corner that are here to help you be successful. That sign world's strength is our association of owners and, and that we have, we received help, whether it was two and a half years ago or five and a half years ago or or 11 years ago. You just heard Don say. His number one tip came from a guy, you know, a, an owner that he connected with when he first started, right? And so that you're going to have similar experiences to that where we can either share images that you can use as you go to, to sell a sign or put on your website. Um, and then you're going to walk out of a meeting and, and you're going to give 
someone that you've connected to a call that says, okay, I've got a chance to bid on this large ADA sign project for uh, an apartment complex. What do I need to be, questions do I need to be asking? What do I need to look for? How can you price it? So that, that in and of itself is going to help you. I, again, I had no sign experience. I didn't know an ADA sign from a channel letter, from a, from a lobby sign, from a, a vehicle graphic, right? It, it, but through the help of the sign world, the training, the other owners, you start to pick up things um, and, and you kind of, I wouldn't say fake it till you make it, but you, you definitely, you know, get in situations where you leverage that association, those other owners to help you out. And then you learn from it and continue to get better and better and stronger and stronger. So um, I'm pretty confident going in and talking to people now and selling them signs. That wasn't the case five and a half years ago, but it also didn't hold me back from selling. Very good. Thank you, Ben. Then, Don, your thoughts? Um, yeah, my background is more operations than sales. Um, and I will tell you that we're not really selling because people who come to you have already determined they have a need for a sign, right? So it's not like you're, uh, yeah, you're selling anything. You're basically trying to outrun the other sign companies that this person may have contacted or may not have contacted, right? I mean, signage is an event-driven business. You buy a building, you need to put a sign on it. You buy a vehicle, you need to put graphics on it. You're having a golf tournament, you need to have T-signs, right? So it's a matter of you being better than the other sign companies. And that really comes down to customer service and performance. Um, and comes back to that uh, word I used before, which is velocity, right? And there's no hard selling in this. This is, you can't knock on the door and say, hey, you wanna buy a sign? I mean, I don't think that's ever been successful. I, I did two cold calls in my entire 11 years and I have a hundred percent close rate and I'm not going to do a third one. <laughs> so. Love that. Very good. Thank you, Don. Jack, would you like to expand a little bit on our sales and marketing training programs? Yeah, but before that, uh, realize 90% of our owners have never done sales before. We're really going to the business coaches that found you and saying, bring us the operational skill set person that will show up for the appointment, deliver the project on schedule. That's the anomaly in our industry. You know, in my mind, sales is convincing somebody to buy something they didn't plan to buy. That's not what we're doing. We're going to people who already have the need. And as Don said, we're saying we're a good choice because we have that background to manage the project. We're consulting with a customer. We're not selling to them. So it's a manageable role. But if you join sign, well, we're not only going to spend a lot of time talking about it in new owner training, giving you strategies, how to get in front of customers and what to do, but then reinforcing it with a weekly sales uh, training class, starting with Ken's class for like the first year, graduating to my class for the second year, uh, where we're gonna talk every week about how do we get in front of customers and how do we present ourselves more effectively and how do we allow the customer to choose us. Uh, lots and lots of sales marketing training over the course of the business. Thank you. Ken, anything to add? In a lot of respects, we're part of the construction industry. We're no different than the plumber or the electrician. Do you think they're really salesmen? <laughs> if they show up on time and say, I can fix your toilet and I've done it before, I don't think that's selling. That's more of order taking. It's not a hard sell business at all. Again, it's show up on time, tell them you can do what they want to do and you should be very busy. Very good. Thank you, Ken. Okay, I see Logan, you have your hand raised next. If you can go ahead and go off mute and share your question. Hey, good morning. Thank you. So kind of looking forward after the initial startup phase, with the vertical type flow of the sign world, uh, you know, ecosystem, have y'all ever considered uh, you know, vertical integration of whatever's upstream of your your cog and what that might be. Thank you. Okay. So thinking about expanding your business. Don, you've been in it the longest. Have you ever had those thoughts? Yes, I have. I actually have looked at a couple of opportunities, but it wouldn't be more of an upstream. It'd be more of an expansion of buying another company that does the same thing I do in a different territory. So it would be a geographical expansion. But at the end of the day, as Ken said before, I'm doing four and a half million dollars in one location. That's uh, 10 minutes from my house. Um, so there's really no reason to try to do that. I mean, 
the, the model is perfect. I'm doing business in probably, I want to say, 30 states right now. I'm writing checks to 55 or 60 sign world owners every year for installing the signs that I make. So I can reach pretty much the entire United States um, from Atlanta, Georgia, right? I don't have a sign in Alaska and I don't have a sign in Hawaii. I did try when I was on my Alaska trip, but they wouldn't buy anything from me. But uh, yeah, there was no real reason to go ahead and buy some other, someone else. Now, if the opportunity presented itself to that someone had a good business and good employees, I would probably acquire a business more for the employee and the human capital more so than for the capital capital of it. So that I would acquire for the customer base or the employee base. That would be the reason why I would do it, but I haven't found a perfect match at this point in time. Okay. Tony, newer to the business, have you ever considered expanding, going upstream? Uh, I'm way too busy right now to even think about it. So the answer is going to be straight out just no, just honestly, not yet. Good. Honest answer is good. How about you, Ben? Uh, I, I looked at buying a sign installation company that came up for sale that I had leveraged and I used a lot or used as one of my vendors. And um, the two things I'll say, one of the reasons why I bought it was I couldn't afford to lose them. Um, but the math just didn't work as books weren't in, in good enough shape. Um, for me to take on the risk, but I will say again to, to highlight the help how helpful the association of owners is. I had emailed Dan, and he gave me three names of of sign owners to call and talk to, and then one of which I had done training with. So I actually called four different sign owners, three of which that had done had a similar um, acquisition during their career, you know their their tenure, um, and so was really able to to gain a lot of insight from them of questions to ask. So ultimately, I did not do it. Um, but yes, I have looked at kind of expansion, not geographically like Don talked about, but just kind of adding capabilities, adding, a, a, in this case, it was a, you know, a couple bucket trucks and a couple employees. Very good. Thank you, Ben. Jack, your thoughts? You know, there's a couple of reasons why you might want to expand or do things. One is, um, I've capped out my market and I don't believe that happens in our industry because, because you're not bound to the territory, you can have regional and national customers. Limited business is you. Uh, it's how big you can think and how big you want to grow. And some people at some point will say, you know, it's big enough. I don't need it bigger. I've built a good quality life. And I want to take 18 vacations a, a month like Don does. Um, there's others that say I'm bored. And yet every project we do is unique and different. Uh, we have what we call a career club of owners that have been with us 20 years and more, because by that time they've been a sign roll owner more than they've been a a career per, uh, a corporate person. We have over 50 operations that have hit that. Some now at 25 years, some at 30 years, many others in their teen years getting close to joining career club. We go to them and say, are you bored? They go, I'm doing stuff I've never done before. It's still a, a, a challenge to figure it out. That's the blessing of the business. So there's not really as much need to do that in our industry as there is in others. Uh, many franchises, uh, franchisees end up selling the business, doing something else because they get bored out. We really don't have that issue. Very good. Ken, any thoughts? Over the 34 years of Sign World, there have been a good number of owners who have bought out competitors in their area. And remember, the chances are when it's time for you to sell your business to all of our owners here, chances are 98% of the time you're going to sell to a competitor in your neighborhood. So it's going to happen, and it has happened. Along the years, there's been sign world owners who have gone the other way and have gone to bigger and bigger projects as opposed to trying to buy another sign company. So you can grow both ways and be very successful, whatever uh, uh, seems to fit at the time. If you are looking at uh, buying another sign company, we at corporate staff will be helping most happy to help you analyze the deal that it's a, a worthy purchase absolutely thank you ken all right we have one more participant with our hand raised so we'll make this the last question for today anthony if you can take yourself off of mute and share your question did you each talk about how you financed your business and i'm specifically interested in uh, anyone that used uh, robs the 401k rollover to do so 
Tony, we'll start with you. Did you use a Rob's or how'd you fund your business? I roll, I used um, the Rainmaker program through Benetrends. Um, so I, I basically did what you're saying. I rolled my entire 401k into the business. Um, I guess it's the same program as what you're talking about, just termed differently through Benetrends. Um, I will tell you that I would marginally recommend them, but the, the program itself was a phenomenal way to do it. Um, I would probably choose a different broker to do it, but it, it's the right, it's the right way to go for me and it worked well. Okay. Ben? I did not do that way. I, I personally funded it. Okay. Don, how about you? I went the Benetrends route. Uh, my broker, my Edward Jones advisor said, uh, basically what you're doing is betting that you can outperform the stock market. And I believe in myself better than the stock market. I think I can do better than Bitcoin too. So I did that. Uh, also, if I did sell my business for $5 million, it would go into the 401k that was created for the company. And I wouldn't have to pay any of the gains taxes on selling of that business until I started to withdraw funds from the 401k thing. So it's a tax advantage up front as well as in the back end. Thank you, Don. Jack? You know, probably 90% of people joining Sun will, if they have a 401k, are using that to fund the business. The ones that don't have that are doing an SBA loan or self funding it or doing a home refinance. Know that we have two participants here from Canada where the 401 program, I believe, is something similar to that in Canada. How that works, I don't know exactly. Uh, go back to your coach and have them help you counsel on how to finance it for those of you that are coming from Canada. Thank you, Jack. Ken, any thoughts? I use my 401k, and if you're planning on selling your business for a lot of money, several million dollars or more, the 401k, the rollover is the only way to go, all because of what Don mentioned, taxes. Very good, very good. All right, well, we are at time. So first off, I want to say thank you to Don, Tony, and Ben for taking time out of your days to uh, spend with us and our participants ask, answering questions. We really appreciate you. And for our participants, we appreciate you joining us as well and uh, your interest in Sign World. We look forward to those future conversations we'll continue to have to help you decide if this is the right uh, chapter in, or the next chapter in your life. Um, so with that, we'll close out for today and we really appreciate everybody joining in. Thank you.